So today let's try to fix this Soviet alarm clock with the help of this 50 MHz dual channel oscilloscope with the built-in multimeter and function or signal generator from FNIRSI. So big thanks for the donation and we will try to use this one as a tool to diagnose this one and find the failure in it and fix it if possible. Let's open it. And also very quick look at the specifications. 4-bit half-true RMS value, intelligent anti-burning. And there's some specifications here, if you want to read it. But now let's take a look at it. Nice housing. Here is the oscilloscope in a bag. And all the accessories. Multimeter probes. This charging cable is this one. This is probably for the signal generator. And the two oscilloscope probes here with the accessories, even the screwdrivers for calibration, and here it is. The inputs, the output probably, one of button USB charging port, and the multimeter probes will go here. Let's try to turn it on. It's loading. Doesn't seem to be in English. It's a touch screen oscilloscope. Whatever this is. Can I actually change the language to English? Nice. The brightness, sound, some color setting, auto shutdown, USB sharing, and probably if it starts as a multimeter, oscilloscope, or a function generator. Let's activate the multimeter. And here you choose voltages, diodes, and continuity test, resistances, capacitors. Milliamps or amps, currents, AC or DC, even temperatures it looks like. And automatic. And it seems to be showing the history of the reading here. It's like a slow rolling oscilloscope, quite a long time base. Here are the probes with some covers on them. And now of course let's try the clock. Nothing happening. And somebody already took the screws out for me, how nice. So it just all comes out. And here you can see the fuse, the transformer and some components in the power supply. And a different board here for the display. Here the keypad, the chip here. These go here. Let's choose a continuity test. And this is a diode. Here's the continuity test and it should beep. And let's measure the fuse. It's not open a circuit. So let's choose the resistances and let's measure on the plug if I can see the resistance of the primary of the transformer. 1.8 kilo ohms. This actually could be a resistance of primary of a tiny 220 volt transformer. Generally the higher the voltage, the higher the resistance of the winding. And also the smaller the transformer, the higher the resistance of the windings. Let's see if the clock draws any current from mains. Milliamps. AC. It actually tells me to put the probes in this way. Of course I do it the dodgy way. And measuring the current it draws. About 10 milliamps. So something does draw current but it's a bit too low current for this type of a clock. And this might be just the magnetizing current of the transformer. I expected about 15 to 20 milliamps. Let's try to take the front panel off. You rotate it and take it off. And now you can see the vacuum fluorescent display. This is for hours, minutes and some symbols and seven days of a week. Abbreviations in Russian. And this Soviet chip. A tiny crystal, some capacitor. Not much else. Most of the functionality is actually in the chip. And there's a tiny adjustment capacitor for the speed. And the power supply board seems to have two zeners on it. Some resistor, the fuse. A bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, two electrolytic capacitors, one ceramic capacitor here, 68 nano, and that's it, and the beeper for the alarm. And this one is actually made in a 93. The type is Electronica 72101, and this actually says made in Russia, no longer made in USSR. So it's quite a late piece. Now let's measure some voltages. Let's plug it in, nothing's happening. Volts, AC, the first and the last pin of the display should be the heater voltage. Nothing. That's odd. 
The main is just goes there, fuse into the primary of the transformer, and the heater secondary goes straight into this heater. There is really not much to go wrong. The power supply board is connected to the other board using these six wires, and we have to untwist these to separate the board and to take some measurements on the power supply board. It seems there is no voltage coming from it. This comes off, this falls off, and here is the other side of the power supply board. There is really not much in terms of primary to secondary side isolation distance, but it also doesn't have any metal parts exposed, so it should be fine. Here is the evacuation stem of the display, which is actually very easy to break here, you have to be very careful. Now let's measure some AC voltages. This should be the primary, and it is based on the voltage. This should be the heater winding, about 5 volts. And it about is, it has a center tap, about half of the voltage here, and here also, this all looks good. The anode winding, about 30 volts, this is the right ballpark. Let's switch it to DC voltages and measure the electrolytic capacitors. And virtually no voltage on this one, virtually no voltage on this one. Let's measure the output of the bridge rectifier, also almost no voltage. What about the input of the bridge rectifier? Almost no voltage. Well, actually on this end of these two traces, the full voltage 31 volts and no voltage on the other end of it. That's odd. Some trace has to be broken. Zero, this is good. This trace, 30 volts between the ends of the trace. So this trace on the board has to be broken somewhere. We need a closer look. It's actually not making a connection from here to here. It looks there's a crack in the trace here. Which makes sense because the transformer is heavy and if you drop it, it moves the transformer and breaks it here. I guess the heater windings have to be also broken because the heater is not getting the voltage. I guess this is where the heater supply voltage is broken. Also this joint is broken. One of the primary terminals, but it was accidentally making a contact and it was working. Let's fix the broken traces here. Let's bridge the gaps. Even though a more permanent solution would be to run a wire from one end of it to the other end of it. But now just to see if it works. Let's plug it in and see. Well, it actually works. Of course, when it's opened, the buttons have a tendency to just all spill out of it. And this keeps them in place, but it's actually just a piece of a blank circuit board. And it seems to be working. Of course, I spilled out the buttons. It's like graphite cubes coming out of a reactor. And now the power supply. DC voltages, one electrolytic capacitor. 26 volts, this is the anode voltage. And the other electrolytic capacitor. 12 volts, this is the chip voltage. The multimeter also has a diode test. It measures diodes. It can even measure the voltage drop of a white LED, 2.7 volts. It actually goes up to about 3.1 volts. Most multimeters have a diode test up to just 2 volts, so this is useful. It also has a capacitor measurement. This one is 6.8 micro, and the reading is quite close. The resistance measurement seems to go up to the typical 20 mega ohms. Now let's try the oscilloscope. Using channel 1, connected to the heater voltage. 2 volts per division, vertical probe 10 to 1, DC coupling, 20 MHz bandwidth, limit off. Trigger, channel 1. How do I change the timer base? They're automatic. This is a bit too much sensitivity, isn't it? 2 volts per division. Should be right. Function measure voltage RMS. This should be useful. Duty cycle frequency voltage peak to peak. Channel one and channel two. FFT. Nice. After go one second. Infinite. XY mode. You can save the images. Fifty percent automatic trigger. I guess. That's the pulses on one of the grids or segments of the display. It's multiplexed. It's a square wave but quite modulated. Are the electrolytic capacitors rotten in it? Based on this probably yes. Now two channels in use, two grids of the display and two succeeding multiplex channels. It should be about a square wave. 
But this random amplitude jumping is from the multiplex frequency beating with the 100Hz ripple on the Rotten Electrolytic capacitor here. The capacitor in it is 100 micro, just like this one. Let's try to actually parallel this to it. When I connect it, it's much more steady. Without it jumping, with it steady. And also the display gets brighter when the capacitor is connected, because the average voltage is higher without the ripple. And also when you measure the DC voltage on the capacitor lower, or the same as the AC voltage before the rectifier, it's a sign the capacitor is bad, high ESR, low capacitance or open circuit. And to change the timer base you actually tap the sides of the screen, which took me some time to figure out. That's the ripple on the rotten capacitor. Slide shutdown. Let's try to connect it to a charger. And it shows it's charging here. And this is the original fuse in it, 0 0.25 amps, made in 93. I believe it's way too high end for a better fire safety. I'm using a slow 32 milliamp fuse in it. The fuse is in it now. And also the traces are fixed the ugly but more reliable way by laying wires on the board. Measuring the ESR of the problematic electrolytic capacitor and it shows open circuit. The other one shows 0 0.4 ohms, this one is not bad. This is still kind of acceptable for a 100 micro capacitor. Let's also try this internal resistance tester, which is meant for batteries, but it seems it can also measure the ESR of electrolytic capacitors. For the bad capacitor it shows 400 bloody ohms, and for the good one 1 ohm. But of course this one is using just 1 kilohertz instead of 100 kilohertz, so the readings are a bit different. And the good one is the chip voltage capacitor, and both are 100 micro, 63 volts. Despite for the chip you'd be able to use, let's say, a 16 volt capacitor. The anode voltage capacitor has to be replaced. Let's use this for a replacement. This one says about 0 0.27 ohms. And this one quite similar to it. And the capacitance meter of this one, 9 at 9 micro, just 3 nano. And that's completely gone. And as is typical with these old Soviet clock boards, every trace you touch with a soldering iron comes off and you have to replace it with a wire. 31 volts on it, and the AC is 25, 26, and using it as an oscilloscope, let's try AC only coupling here, the ripple on the capacitor, about 1.4 volts peak to peak, which isn't much out of about 30 volts. Can I see it in the DC mode? You can briefly see it. Why doesn't it actually show it? Just a line. But anyway, the clock is working. Many years ago I came across another of these. But looking at the display it's not exactly the same version. This one is a newer version which has these symbols on the top of the display. And of course the schematic of the clock. This one seems to be the older version but almost the same. The electrolytic capacitors in it seem to be now higher values. But it's using the same chip and the display has the same symbols, just positioned differently. The mains comes in here via the fuse, here's the transformer, the bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes. The vacuum fluorescent display has a directly heated cathode, so a center tap on this heater winding is used as the cathode connection. And via a Zener 7.5 volts, it's connected to the negative of the power supply. This is actually drawn upside down, with the positive being the common, so that's basically minus 30 volts about. That's the zero, and for the chip that's minus 12 volts. And the power supply for the chip is just a zener, a transistor amplifying the current and a couple of resistors. The zener is 12 volts. Here's the beeper with its parallel resistor. There's a ceramic capacitor 68 nano in parallel to the electrolytic one here. They're using 68 nano instead of 100 nano, which is typically just put everywhere. Here's the multiplexed keyboard, the chip, the crystal and some capacitor. Maybe this capacitor in parallel to the tunable one is omitted here. And the crystal is 32768 Hz, a typical watch frequency crystal, a low frequency crystal. The schematic is very simple because everything is in the chip, but the way you set it and use it is a bit more complex. Let's put the clock back together. The display isn't super crazy bright, but definitely usable if it's not under studio lights. And it doesn't seem worn. The segments are actually white, not grey. Let's show some better close up of it. It looks nice. I don't notice any darkening, it probably wasn't used much. And of course the last thing to test is the signal source. Or signal or function generator. It can produce a sine wave, square wave, sawtooth, half wave, full wave, stepped in both directions, DC, and this line up or down, multi-audio or sync pulse. If 
from 1 Hz all the way to 10 MHz it seems amplitude up to 3 volts and duty cycle it only applies to the square wave let's connect this to a speaker and see Nice! What if I give it a self-oscillating beeper here? Can I hear the low frequencies? 2 Hz? Let's connect this to an oscilloscope. higher frequencies, 500 kilohertz, still looks nice, 2 megahertz, still acceptable, 5 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and 10 megahertz. Does the crystal run? When I switch this one to the oscilloscope mode, let's connect it here and see It works, and then you can use it to calibrate the probes, of course. But keep in mind that there is always some DC offset. This is the zero level, so the waveform is not centered around the zero. The video is getting long, but let's measure the power consumption of the fixed clock. About 12.7 milliamps. That's actually less than I expected. And the DC voltmeter in combination with my wattmeter, 2.3 watts. One digit more resolution with the 10 times more sensitive socket. 2.31 watts. And of course the clock isn't really that dim if it's not under studio lights. And the way you set it, you press this, then for example 5 for Friday, and then you type the time in, for example 20, 3, 40, 5, and enter. And that's it, and it's running. So that's it. A nice 3 in 1, an oscilloscope, a multimeter, and a functional generator. Big thanks for the donation. And the clock is working. And if you like my videos, please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You're making this other channel possible.